uh, as a preface, uh, let's think back to how we do version control. If, if, you're like, uh, if you're like me in the good old days when we needed to make a backup of a file, you do something like this. I still do this. And um, yeah, if you need more than one backup, you've got to either date it or something like that, right? <laughs> uh, and then, uh, then you need to back up a whole directory, right? And then, of course, is the sharing problem. So you've got to schlep some, fi some files around uh, with rsync and put it on a shared server, right? Then CVS came out. I remember using, what was the precursor to CVS? RCS? RCS. Yeah, so RCS was, was uh, uncertain, didn't know what I was doing, but it seemed to work if I typed the magic runes in. Uh, CVS was really nice. It gave us a central place for our changes and um, saved the source code. Uh, source code changes were saved as a diff between where it was and where it is now. And so patches were small. Really, it's a collection of patches, CVS. Very nice that way, especially for textual data. Um, however, uh, remote development in CVS is a little frustrating. Uh, it requires that network connection to be there all the time for simple things like, uh, you know, what's the status of this file? Well, uh, let me go ask the server. Uh, distributed development, of course, is nearly impossible in Git, and that's because it's a centralized model. It, it wants to be one true s source of authority in the middle, and, and it was designed for that. Uh, branching in CVS is surprisingly easy, but merging is nearly impossible. So making your branching not as uh, useful. Uh, if you've stuck, tried to stick binaries in CVS, it works. Um, I've also corrupted a number of, of my own CVS repositories through some interruption of an, of an operation. And, and then it's kind of slow. Now, CVS came out of the constraints of its time. Slow networks, not much disk space. What if we could start over? Where, um, what if we had unlimited disk space, which we essentially do now? and fast networks, basically reliable networks. We would, wouldn't we kind of go back to how we were doing things? We just copy dot back things, right? We'd, we'd store the whole file, right? Why not? Instead of a diff and trying to patch, because uh, it's simple. That's the simplest way to do things, is just take the file and move, move it out of the way. So what, what does this look like? If you didn't have a chance to clone that repo, please do so now. This will be the last time this URL will be on the screen. Um, um, this um, go and then uh, change directories into that uh, checked out repository. Uh, before you type source dbc shell, uh, you should never source any shell file that you don't haven't uh, looked at. I invite you to look at it. Okay, uh, it has five or six um, functions, and there's no code that will be executed once you source it. It will just define some functions for you. We will be. Uh, using these functions. These functions will disappear when your shell session terminates. Um, uh, so take a moment to look at that if you're uncertain of my motives. What we're going to be doing today is writing git using the born shell. This will only take about 15-20 uh, minutes. So to begin, let's talk about what are the purposes of a version control system. One of is, is of course to record the state of objects or files over time. And the second is to record the state of the hierarchies or directories over time or the relationship of the files over time. And when you think about it, directories are really just metadata for the files. It's how they're related. It's an imposing an order on them. And they, there's nothing um, first order about directories themselves. So if we were to um, begin writing our own version control system using the Born shell today, we might do something like this. Here's our, don't do this. Um, here's our test repo. This is where our source code will live. We're going to CD into it. We're going to type, ha start hacking away. But before we do that, we're going to initialize our repository. We're going to create a .dvc shell directory. And inside of that, we're going to create an objects directory. This is, this is uh, basically how Git operates. So, but because we're lazy, we don't want to type these three commands. We're going to write a shell function to do that for us. In the first half of this function, we accept a path name. Uh, if the path uh, does not exist as a directory, we print a friendly message and return. Uh, otherwise, we change directory into that path. We export a shell variable, capital DVC shell, 
which we will make use of in subsequent functions. And we then um, make the objects directory in there. And then we print a friendly message that we've completed our work. Uh, I need to um, state my standard Born Shell disclaimer. I'm not a professional Born Shell programmer. I've, I've written 20 years of Born Shell and do not consider myself a professional Born Shell programmer. So don't look to this as like the right way to, how did that guy do that Born Shell stuff? This is probably not what you want to reference. So, OK. So now we can try this. We have sourced our dvc.sh file. So we can uh, go ahead and shell this, uh, make dir test repo, and init test repo. So this is invoking our shell function init that we, that we just uh, sourced. So what this does in a picture, uh, the big beige box is test repo, our, where our source code will live. Our source code will live down here. And then inside of that is a DVC directory, and inside of that is an objects directory. So now we're ready to uh, add some content. Let's um, don't do this. Uh, let's create a file, some file. Now, remember the two purposes of the version control system are to record the state of objects over time and the hierarchies, the relationship of those objects over time. So we need to save objects in a way that the name of the object doesn't matter, right? If we, if we just copied some dash file into our repository, when we needed to make an update to that file, we copy it in again, and now we've either clobbered it or we've got to name it one, two, and we have to come up with these silly naming schemes. So what are some options? How would we name our files once they're inside the directory? Uh, we could use a UUID, right? UUIDs are basically unique. But what about this? What if we named the file by its SHA-1 hash? Right, you take the file, the contents of the file, and you run them through the SHA-1 or SHA-256 algorithm, your favorite hashing algorithm. That allows us to store the file uniquely. Uh, we won't have any duplicates in there, uh, so minor space savings things. But it has an interesting side effect. And that is that if the file were corrupted or tampered with, we could immediately know it we could take the object as it exists in the objects directory and compare it, uh, compare its hash with its own name. And if they don't match, we know that the file has been corrupted or tampered with. So there's some nice security side effects of doing it this way. So this is what we would do, is we would SHA some, some file and uh, just get the hash out of that. And then we could copy our file into the objects directory now. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to introduce two more functions, uh, underscore hash object, which takes a file, and then we hash it and return its hash. Uh, the second function is add. This is equivalent to git add. We take the file name, we then invoke our hash object function up here, and we copy this file that we just received into the objects directory. So let's do this. Go ahead and type these commands. Uh, and if you use the same uh, syntax and same content, we will all have the same hash IDs. That's another interesting side effect is um, we will have, uh, you can compare someone else's content with your content and if the file is the same, it will have the same hash no matter where it lives. Okay, we're going to what I call explore the space here. If you go ahead and type SHA sum sum file, and then if you do a find in your .dvc shell directory, you'll see a couple files, and one of them will match in the objects the, the, the output of this hash. And if you cat that file, <coughs> you'll see that it's our original sum file. And please uh, interrupt me at any time uh, for questions or if I'm going too quickly or too slowly. So in a picture, Here's what we've done. We've created some file. This is our working directory. We've taken its hash, and we've copied this file into our objects directory and named it after its hash. This is called content addressable. It means that the file is named by some property of its content. Just a fancy term for that. So what have we done? We have recorded the state of objects over time. We could modify some dash file and add it again, and we would get a new object in our objects directory.
Now the problem is, of course, that we um, we can't tell what came first. So to remedy that, here's the, the the upper part of this function you'll recognize. That's our original add function. This new section down here. Uh, we're not only going to copy the file, uh, the object into the uh, repository by its hash, but we're going to record the fact that we did that in a file that we'll call the index. So uh, I'll come back to this in a moment. So what we do is we take the hash of the file and uh, with a tab character and the file name and a new line, and we echo that into a, um, an index.temporary file. Then we atomically move that file uh, and call it index. And now, uh, this little dance up here, if the index already exists, we use egrepv, which, which um, selects all the lines that do not match. So this is essentially subtracts any existing names, uh, files by that name from the index, so that we only store the, the, the file name once. The file name only exists once in our index. So let's go ahead and do this. Now if you do add some file, and we've, we've already run this, but you can run it again, and you cat the index, you should see uh, that we have now a mapping of the hash IDs to their names in our working directory. So what we've done is, here's where we were. We've got our file in the repository, but we've also now added an index. And this index points to the state of things at this point in time. Now, this is great, uh, because now we have a way to, we don't have to grep through all the files in our objects directory to pull them back out. We can just consult the index. Hey, where's some dash file? Oh, it's that one. OK, I'll just pull that one out. So we're, we're slowly going from a very manual version control system where we have to you know, do this stuff to where, you know, where it's mostly automated by the shelf for us. So now we don't have a way to record the state of things over time. So this is, this is the new function we're going to introduce, commit. So we take the, uh, what we're going to do is record the index as well and add it to the uh, repository. So the state of the index as, as it existed at this point in time. The next thing we'll do is create a new file called commit.last that holds the SHA-1 hash of the index at the time of the commit and also the hash of the previous commit, if it exists. So it may not exist yet. In fact, our first commit will not have that. Uh, but if it does exist, then we will add to our commit last uh, a, a parent pointer to the previous commit. We'll add a friendly comment, if there was one, and then um, this little section down here, we're going to add the commit itself as another object in the repository. And finally, we will point, we will uh, copy the SHA of, um, let's see, oh, this one, yeah, of the object, of the commit object into our head pointer. So go ahead and do this. Let's type commit first commit. So we've gone from this, where we've, we have our index, and now we're going to impose an ordering on everything. We copy the index down, the red dotted line, into our repository. It has a hash, 9CA. You should have the same hash because our contents are the same. And then we create a commit object, which is a little file that has a pointer to it. Now your commit object will have a different hash than mine because the dates are going to be different. Um, if it, it didn't record my username, but if it did, that would be different too. Uh, and, and then we point our head to that object there. So by looking at head, we can always find our most recent commit. So go ahead, let's explore the space. Let's look in the find, do, do find.dvc shell. And if you do a head on the objects, you'll see all these things. You'll see the index that's in there. You'll see the commit that we made. You'll see the, uh, the object that we created. Now, um, this is nice. You might be saying to yourself, this is great, but um, only if all the files live in one directory, right? How does this handle hierarchies? Most projects we work on have nested hierarchies, directories that are deep. Well, let's try that. Go ahead and uh, make a subdirectory in your repo. Uh, echo subfile into it, subdir slash subfile and then run the add command. Add will um, 
of course, uh, copy the object by its hash and also update the index. So we'll have something like this. Uh, so we've created subdirectory and subfile. When we run add, watch the index, and so we create a new blob in there. And we also, if you'll notice in the index, the index holds the full path to the file. So this way we have a map of hashes to paths, not just file names. So let's run another commit. Call it second commit. Yeah, because we could, well, if you're running your net, is your head still pointing to the, the one without the subdirectory? Correct. Yes, right now as it is in the repo, we're, we're pointing to the state of things as they were last time. We haven't run our commit yet. That's right. So if we run our second commit now, Remember, what we, when we make a commit, we do a couple of things, right? We add the index to the repository, as if it were another object. Then we add, we create the commit object and point that to the index. And then we update the head pointer. So here's where we are. We're going to copy the index down here. And it contains the state of the uh, working directory as it exists now. So it points to both some file and the subfile. We create our new commit object to point to that index, and we repoint head. Does this data structure look familiar? It is a DAG. What is a DAG? CS majors. Yeah, directed acyclical graph. DAGs allow us to traverse back to any known point in time and know precisely what the state of things were, was. So you got head pointing to here, which points to the previous, all the way up to the very first commit, which does not have a parent, which is how you know this is the end. We could explore the space. You'll see um, the new commits we've made, the pointers have changed, but all the things that we've added still stay right where they were. So we're now to the point where we can view our history as well. This is where things start getting kind of fun. And it's also the, the, um, about the last thing we'll do with DVC shell before we move into Git. If there is uh, not a head pointer, that means we haven't made any commits, because head is created at the first commit time. So, But if there is a head, we're going to look at it. We're going to pull out the SHA that's inside of it. That is going to point to what? The most recent commit. That's correct. And then we will uh, create. We'll, we'll set up a little path variable so that we can find that. This little loop here. Uh, There's some bash. While uh, well, this will run in the Born shell as well without bash. Uh, while the SHA hash variable is not empty or zero length, z for zero length, we're going to print out the uh, commit ID, the SHA hash. Then we're going to grep out some things from that commit: the date, the comment, and print a, a blank line. Then we're going to look inside of that um, commit for a line that starts with parent. And if there is one, we're going to pick out its uh, ID, and we're going to reset path to it. And then we will do it again. This is not yet blank. We will print out the commit. We will look for a parent. Once we get to the very first commit, this parent is empty. And so this, this now becomes zero length. And this stops the loop, and we're done. So uh, you can run that command. I don't have a slide for this, but you, you can go ahead and type log. Well, that's all you type, log. And it should show you a backward history of all the commits we've made. Commit 2, commit 1. So we have just resolved both of the purposes of a version control system. We've recorded the state of the hierarchies over time. We have just implemented 80% of what makes Git special. Um, using the Born shell. And you can probably imagine a few ways to do uh, things like diff, tags, checkout, status. Uh, so how would you do diff? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a shortcut I hadn't thought of. Yep. You, you look at the index. Where is this file in the index? 
or in the repository, what's it called, and what is it now? Uh, if the SHAs match, we're done. If they don't, we can just pipe it through diff, right? Hand it off to Unix diff and let it do the work. So let's talk about Git. Okay, we are done with the DVC shell. You can delete that directory. You can uh, uh, probably best to move out of that directory regardless of whether you keep it or not. Um, we are now moving clearly and firmly into the Git world. Uh, you can do this anywhere, provided you have Git installed on your laptop. If you don't, you can maybe SSH to a server that does. Uh, make a new new repo, we'll call it. Uh, this is where our source code will live. Uh, change directory into that repo. Git init. The dot is optional. I think it's default if it's not specified. We're going to remove the hooks directory. It's um, I won't be talking about hooks at all in this presentation. Uh, because of the way we're going to be interacting with the .git directory, it will just make a mess for us on our screen, and, and there's a lot of hooks in there, so just, just blow it away. It won't cause any harm. Git will, uh, Git will understand. All right, so we've, I've mentioned explore the space before, and uh, we're going to get a little bit more rigorous with what this term means. Um, when I say explore the space, we're going to talk about what does head have in it? And we're going to use just the Unix cat command to figure that out. Are there any refs or references in, that we should be looking at? We'll use the Unix head command. What does the index look like? This is git. Git has an index too, like dvc shell. And um, we're going to use the ls files. Uh, the dash s stands for staged or staging or something like that, which usually means some kind of index operation. Are there any objects? We're going to use the git find command. This is why we remove the hooks directory, because it makes a mess every time you do this. Just too much content. Are there any, uh, what, what, what do the object's contents look like? And we'll use a uh, cat file, which is another git command. Dash p stands for, I think, pretty print. And you give it a, a commit-ish ID or some kind of a hash. Now, git has two classes of commands. You may have heard this, porcelain and plumbing. Uh, the plumbing commands are these kind of low-level compositional commands, and, and these are clearly in the plumbing category, ls files and cat file. There'll be a couple other little plumbing commands I'll introduce to you. You don't use them from day to day, and so you don't need to remember them. You can always look them up. Uh, the porcelain are the nice, shiny ones that usually compose these lower-level commands to get their work done. So we are now in our Git repository. Go ahead and please type exactly this uh, so that we can share again the same hash IDs. We're going to get add this file. So now if we're exploring the space. If you do a find in the .git directory, you should find just that. Does anyone get a different ID. Does anyone get exactly that ID? Yeah. Now one interesting thing, did you get that? Yep. Okay. If you, one interesting thing that Git does is um, that FD, as you can see, is a directory, but it is part of the hash. Git takes the first two characters of the hash and uses it as a directory. So that gives us what? 256 directories essentially to spread things out so they're not like, you know, tens of thousands of files in one directory. Um, Linux, at least a few years ago, had a maximum number of entries in a directory, like it was 32K, roughly. And so, uh, and you can easily blow past that for long-lived projects. But this helps, this helps mitigate that somewhat. And Git has another mechanism I'll talk about at the very end to, to mitigate that even further. Okay, let's look and see what is in there. Now, now when we reference a Git ID, we have to use the full hash, or I mean, the, the you have to start with the correct FD, right? Even though it's it looks like 48 is the hash ID, it's not. It's FD 48. So uh, Git Git is smart, and you can only you just have to give it a couple characters so it can uniquely find what you're looking for. Four or five, six is is usually sufficient. Uh, a good file. There's our file. Let's look at the index, and it looks a lot like what DVC shell had. Uh, this is some kind of a looks like a Unix permission. Uh, the hash. Uh, I do not know what the zero is. I didn't research that. 
uh, and then our, the, our file name. What is in the, are there any references? No, not yet. We haven't made a commit. So here's the picture. I won't be illustrating the working directory at all. We won't be concerned with that word. This is inside the .git directory. So we have, we've done added, we've added an object, there it is, and uh, the index has a pointer to it. We're going to update a file now. We're going to echo some space file into some file. So this, we're changing the contents of this object, of this file. Go ahead and add that. Let's do a find again. If you, you should see two objects in there now. There's our old original FD48. And now we also have a 7A1C something or other. Let's look at that file. Ah, it's the one we just created. Uh, here I'm not using the abbreviated dash S, but it's the same. You'll see that the index has been updated. Same file name over there, but with a new hash. So here's where we were, a good file. When we uh, added the new file, watch, we're going to create a new object and watch the index, the hash of the index. Ah, so we've done exactly what we did in DVC show. We've updated the index to point to the new file. And you can get add files all day long, and it will just keep adding objects into your repository and updating the index to match them. So if you add 100 files all at once, is it, does it get the last one, or is it a hash or some other way? So all at once, uh, you mean 100 distinct files. Yes. They will all be added, and they will all be added to the index. You'll have 100 new objects and 100 entries in your index. Uh, this was illustrating that a file is only added once. Uh, for any particular file, it only exists once in the index, just like we did in DVC show. Yeah. In a moment, we'll, we'll, you'll see multiple entries in the index. But you can add, you can add, uh, you can update a file all day long. Uh, you can add files all day long, and, and that's that's all that we're doing here. Git add creates a new blob in the objects directory, and it adds the hash of the blob and the path of the file to the index. That is all that Git add does. Just those two things. Sorry? Where does the index live? Where does the index live? Uh, it, is, it is in the .git directory. I, um, if you do a find, you'll see a should be a file called index. Uh, the, but it's git usually compresses things for space purposes. And so that's why the ls-files ls git command is, is handy. It, it knows how to uncompress those files and integrity check them and then spit out the contents in a human, <laughs> human readable way. Yeah. So that is showing us. Yeah, that's 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 the mechanism to get into the that's index. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the index. Okay, so let's rename a file. Uh, we're going to create a new file to do, to do this. Uh, echo another space file into another file. Go ahead and add it. Who's the fastest? All right, get ls files. We will see. Uh, w this is the index. Um, our old, our good old 7a1c subfile is in there, and the new <coughs> file we've just created, 17d5, is in there. Does everyone, does anyone not see these things? Okay, that's good. So now we're going to move the file, renaming the file. Git move another file. We'll call it Wonder File. I am not a very good namer of things because it's one of the three hard problems in computer science. <laughs> Um, now if we do our git ls files like we did up here, we'll see there's our 7a1c, some file. But you'll see that the index uh, has updated to reflect the new name of the file, but the hash is the same. So the order, is the order alphabetical on file name or, or structure? I, I think so. It, it seems to be. I haven't, uh, I haven't really tested that very thoroughly. I think yes, it's it being friendly to you. I think it's trying to be friendly and, and present things in some kind of a humanish ordering, but I don't know. Yeah. So we went from this. Uh, we added a 
another dash file. There's the there's the object, another file, that's its contents, 17d5. When we watch the index now, when we rename it, git move another file to wonder file, that's all. Nothing changes. Only the index changes in this case. There were no new blobs created because there were no new files created. We just renamed what the one is called. So that's what move does. Git uh, move changes the name of the file in the working directory. Updates the index with the new name. No new blobs. Let's remove a file. Oh, so go ahead and do that. Git remove wonder file. Uh, so there we are with wonder file. Watch the index. There it goes. Git wants to hang on to everything you put into it, so the blobs stay. So um, your blob is still there. You can do a find in your .git objects directory and still see that that's there, and you could uh, do a git cat file on it and still see that its contents are fine. Uh, but we've removed it from the index. So um, remove removes the entry from the index and the working directory, but it doesn't remove any objects. Uh, there's a second command you can do, cached. Uh, git interchanges cache and stage. Uh, they both generally refer when you see them to index operations. It will remove it from the index only. Uh, so git rm cached is almost the inverse of git add, except for the, the blob doesn't go away. Git never removes objects. Okay, let's now record some history. Let's look at head and see what it's pointing to. You should have uh, Ref's head's master. And if you if we look at Ref's head's master, it doesn't exist. We haven't made a commit yet. Like um, uh, the Ref's head's directory uh, points to all of our branches. And right now there's, there's, there are no branches. We've never made any commits. A branch is a pointer to the latest commit on a history. And until we can make a commit, like in DVC shell, there is no history. So let's make a commit. Go ahead and let's do this. Now, this is what I got when I did it. Um, you'll see master. It gives you the branch name. Uh, that root commit only appears once for, per, per branch, um, or maybe even per repository. And then the hash ID. Your hash ID will be different because your name is different than mine, probably. And your um, the date you did it will be different, little things, which is good. This is all metadata that Git keeps track of for you, and you want that. That's all. That's all hashed by Git, so it's it's nice. The who, when, and the what. Um, so now, if we cat Git head, it'll still point to master, but if we cat master, it should point to now. Your hash will not match mine, but they should match each other there. It points to your first commit that you made. A uh, dash M, I believe, stands for message. CVS, that's a, CVS used that same syntax, I believe. Uh, let's look at that file now, that, that um, commit. We can, the cat file dash P is amazing. You can use it on anything you see in the git that you want to, in the git directory that you want to learn about. Uh, you should have a tree. Does anyone not have the 508D tree? Everyone has the 508D tree. This means that you have done it exactly as I've told you to. Uh, the contents of the directory and the files in there are all the same. Uh, you'll have a different author and committer, and then the comment. OK, so when we have a commit, uh, when we make a commit, we go from a collection of objects with no ordering to this. You remember that the, the commit object, that very first line when we did a cat file, pointed to a tree. That's the tree right there, that 508D. Uh, the tree is what points to some file. And there are two other objects in there, a good file and another file that aren't referenced anywhere. They are currently unreachable by Git. Git doesn't know about them, except that they're in there. Um, so now why was only some file added when we did our commit? Guesses? So it's the index. Correct. That was the only thing in the index. And so git looks at the index to know what to do next. The git, the, the index is also called sometimes the staging area. And, and so when we do an add, we're saying, I'm staging this file 
for a if you think of databases, right, you, you, you have a transaction. You, you open you your status, transaction. You're really looking at the index. Beg your pardon? When you do a status, you're looking at the index. Correct. Yeah. It, it compares your working directory with, uh, with the index. Yep. It, it does a few more things as well, but that's largely what you're doing. Uh, yeah, those other two files were not in the index, so they don't get referenced by the tree. Um, go ahead and let's cat that file. You can run cat file on anything in Git. It's great. And it will, depending on what the object is, it will show you something kind of useful. Uh, this is a, uh, again, a Unix permission uh, thing. Uh, hmm? We okay. A uh, blob. That means that this thing here is a blob. And uh, there is a hash, 7a1c. And it refer refers to some dash file in the working directory. So a tree is like a per directory index uh, and, our, and our commit points to it. And then up, master was updated to point to our commit. So when we make a commit, Git creates a tree object, one per directory in your hierarchy. And it creates a commit object that points to that tree, the root tree, and the previous commit, if there was one. And it points the branch to this latest commit. We're going to talk about trees for just a moment. A tree represents a working directory. So a tree is like a file that holds all the other files and directories in it, like a Unix dirent object. If you've ever messed around with the low-level Unix or Linux file systems, there's, there's an object called a dirent, and it is, a, it is itself a file that holds pointers to all of the contents of this directory. Uh, this is a diagram of tree objects from one of my Git repos. The green are the trees, and the yellows are the blobs or, or files. Uh, so this might be my my working direct or my my repo, and then here I have uh, bin, lib, and var, and then stuff under there. You can think of trees, in fact, like directories. Um, you can even think of Git as itself a uh, file system with uh, objects or blobs as the files, and trees as directories, and commits as the state of your file system over time, which is exactly what it is. So let's, um, let's exercise this tree concept a little bit. We're going to make a subdirectory, and we're going to put a file in there. Uh, here's another plumbing command, hash object. A hash object returns the git hash uh, that it corresponds to if it were to be added uh, into the repository. I think git git uses this function when you say git add which is a porcelain command it does a hash object on the file on the path you give it and then it does a copy and a compress and do all the things to get it in there so um, hash object is useful to see what the hash will be if it were to be added so let's add it and if we do a ls files in the staging area we'll see our original sum file as well as the new file you can see that the hashes match it's a way to get a peek into the future of Git. So we have uh, created subfile, and also notice the index contains subdir slash subfile. We just did an ls files on that to show that. Now we're going to make a second commit. Uh, notice that the that little parentheses root commit is gone. It's now we're just moving on. That still shows the branch ID or the branch name, master, and then the commit. Your commit will be different than mine. And here's what we get: we get a a new tree, 23b3, that points to some file because it's in the index, and it points to eb5 triple e, which is another tree, and that's all it knows about. It doesn't know about subfile directly, but that tree does. That tree represents subdir. We make a commit that points to the root tree. And that commit also points to its parent. Master is updated to point to the newest commit. If we cat file 23b36f, we'll see that it matches our uh, working directory. All of the things in our working directory are in there, some file and subdir. And you'll see the tree, blob tree. Those are the, the kind of the two things that Git knows about. 
let's look at that other tree, uh, cat file eb 5 E, and you'll see that it contains subfile. Uh, this is why, incidentally, that you can't store an empty directory in Git. Um, there's no representation for it. Uh, it's a, a tree only exists to point to things, and when there's nothing to point to, there's no, there's no tree there. It, a tree is like a, um, or what, a directory, when you think about it, is really metadata. It, it, it's, it's expressing some relationship between the things, the objects, the files in that hierarchy. And, 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 and as such, Git really doesn't know about them except that, um, as they refer to real things, the objects, the blobs. So trees represent the state of a working directory, and um, uh, commits point always to the root tree. Let me go back. What's interesting here is that if you, you'll see that the very first commit we made still points to its original tree, which points to its original file. So it, it really is a true representation of the state of things at that time. Let's make a branch. Git branch my branch. Uh, Git branch is a uh, side effect free call you can make. It um, merely lists what's in the refs directory. So we, you'll, you'll see master. It may be green if you've got coloring turned on, but it will always have an asterisk next to it uh, because that represents this is the active branch. This is the branch you're on. If we look at our heads now, you should see also this. Our master points to our most recent commit, and my branch also points to our most recent commit. This is why branching in Git, they say, is cheap. It is literally a file with a hash in it. It's a symbolic link. That's it. That is a branch. One little file with one little hash in it. So when we've created a branch, all we're doing is creating another file with a pointer in it. So let's check out my branch. Look at head. Head has changed to reflect our new branch that we're working with. Watch head here. That's a checkout. Easy. Especially if they point to the same thing. Git can say, what was the old commit ID I'm looking at? What's the new one? Oh, they're the same? All right, no change. All it does is updates head. Now, if there were, if it did point to a different commit, it would have to, you know, then crawl through and make the working directory match. But uh, branching is very inexpensive in Git. Now, in, um, in DVC shell, we didn't have the notion of a tree. We just copied the big old index around, didn't we? But it has the same content, so we could still recreate the hierarchy if we needed to, because all the same data is in there. There's just one index uh, that points to all of its things, including the subdirectories and so forth. So let's make a new file on this branch. So here we are. When we create a new file, watch uh, the objects in the index. There's our new branch file. It's just hanging out there, right? What does git add do? It creates a new object and it updates the index. That's it. So we're going to make a third commit. Uh, you'll notice that the branch is now reflecting what branch we're on and also the, uh, the hash of that uh, commit ID. And no root, no frisbee once per repo. Beg your pardon? And no root comment. Right, I think it's once per repo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, instead of once per branch. Uh, let's see, we've made our commit. So we went from this, now we're, here comes our commit. Boom. Um, the 6BB AEC is our new root tree. It points to some file, it points to subdir, and it points to the new branch file. The difference between 6BB AEC and 23B36F is really branch file. That's, that's the only difference between the two. 
uh, we've created a new commit that points to that tree. This commit also points to its parent. My branch points to it. Master still points to where it was a few moments ago. Um, we have a perfectly ordered world. <laughs> Git is amazing. So we've now covered Git's uh, core concepts. Objects, or blobs, trees, which represent a working directory, or a subdirectory within that working directory. Commits, which record a little bit of metadata about the state of the repository at this point in time. And refs, which uh, you can think of symbolic links. A uh, simple text file that holds a commit ID, or a branch name in this case. Uh, we can talk about resets now. So watch, watch uh, the my branch pointer. We're going to do a git reset dash dash soft. And you, you usually give it a commit ID. In fact, you have to give it a commit ID. A soft reset will change the pointer of the branch um, to some other commit. And it's like, if, in this case, it's like going back before an add. Um, Oh, sorry, before a commit, but after the add. So the files are still staged, the file still exists in the repo, the tree exists, but the, uh, we haven't done the commit yet. There's a, the next level of reset is called dash dash mixed, which works exactly like soft, but it also reverts the index. So you would see branch file disappear from the index. So it's like you've made your changes in your working directory, but haven't done a git add on them yet. Git reset hard, which you've probably seen in too many Stack Overflow entries is exactly like mixed except it also reverts the working directory so any changes that you have made in your working directory are gone get a hard a reset hard is something very useful and very dangerous at the same time as most useful things are so use sparingly that's basically git um, we have plenty of time so we uh, are there any questions to this point before we between branch and attack um, not a lot. Uh, we can we can make a tag. Let's go ahead and type uh, git tag. Oh, and there's a variety of tags. That's a problem. You have to read the tag man page to get the full. This is one of the things I hate about git is with one simple command line option on a command, you can completely change what this command is doing. They're, they're not related, right? You really, they, they, there should have been a diff different command for this, but whatever. So yeah, if you just do a simple soft tag, git tag, uh, and then uh, give it give it a tag, my tag, whatever, my dash tag, I don't care. And um, then do a uh, do a find on dot git uh, refs. What do you see in there? And do a git cat file. Uh, well, actually, just cat it. Just use the Unix cat command. There isn't, there isn't a, there isn't much of a difference between a branch and a tag. They, um, they are treated differently by Git, um, but they, they're both kind of like bookmarks, I guess, in a way. That it's, it it's points to a commit. You can also sign your tags, which is very powerful if you want to authenticate that uh, this, uh, you know, I'm saying this point of the repo is a good state. And you don't want to make a new commit. The commit's already there. You're just pointing to the commit, so you can... You can actually sign your tag as well, and, and now you've effectively authenticated that tag so that it can't be modified. You, uh, so it, it joins the ranks of full-fledged Git objects that have you know been got their SHA-1 and things recorded and everything. So a tag really can be interchanged with um, think of them as a commit pointer, a commit bookmark, and they can be interchanged with commit IDs for most practical purposes. Uh, I, in the in the man in the man pages, they're called committish, so it's either commit ID or something that points to a commit ID. All right. When we make commits, we create a linear history. Now remember that each of these commits, uh, each of these commit objects points to a whole tree object, which points to blobs and all the, the whole thing. I'm omitting that now for the sake of simplicity. This is such a nice repo because everything is in such a tidy, straight line. So nice. 
But in real life, we know that mergings hap merge happens, right? Forks happen, branches happen. In a normal merge, we're going to create a new branch. We'll call it topic. Uh, branching creates just another pointer. Now we'll create a new, I shouldn't have called that E prime, should have just been E. But. Right, you, you get into situations like this. We want to join these histories together because this is useful stuff and we want it in line. I want to, I want to pull that into master. So I check out master and I say git merge topic. I'm saying what I'm saying when I do a merge is I want a commit that points to two histories. And that's all a merge typically does. If when, when you see a commit ID, a commit object with two parents, it's a merge commit. And so now if we were to check out H, we would not only receive the A, B, C, and D, but also the changes introduced by E, F, and G into our history. I won't be talking about conflicts, but they happen if, if E, F, or G modified something also that D had modified and Git could not clearly tell, uh, you know, maybe it was in the same set of lines, uh, Git will helpfully um, put some diffish kind of, uh, it will modify the file and say, hey, I've got this and this, what do you want to do? And you can resolve it manually. You can also say git merge dash dash hours, which means it will always take D uh, when there's a conflict. Or you can say theirs, which will give you uh, E, F, or G. Uh, there's a lot of different merge strategies. There's you merge? You have to do a commit after. So is it just inserting whatever changes you make after D on the master? Presuming you were working in the master, you check that out, and that's where you're yeah. going to merge. Yes. Just inserts a new commit after D, and then does H to point to both so of those? If there is no conflict, Git well, merge. There is a conflict. Okay, so yeah. a merge if there is no conflict, yeah. Git merge will create the commit for you. If there is a conflict, Git will wait for you to fix it before it creates. Then you have to do your commit manually. Yeah, but it's just yeah. really creating a new commit before the merge, right? I mean, you are. Oh, but yeah. That's what it's doing. It's yes, you're modifying between D and H there. Yeah, H H will act, actually H includes those changes in it. So you you you've when you if, if you had a conflict between D and G, uh, and you say a um, Git merge topic, uh, okay, Git yeah, will wait. Let you fix it, and those fixes will be included with that merge commit. And when you do the commit, it's everything. Yeah, that's the whole deal. Yep. Have you heard of fast forwards? You've seen that maybe when you do a, a git pull, it'll say fast forward. Fast forward is good. So here we go. Make a make a branch. Again, I should have just used E. All right, so when um, a fast forward merge happens automatically when the branch that you're merging is a pure ancestor of the head branch, uh, the, of the branch that you're merging into. So like that. When I say git merge topic in this case, I can just repoint master to it. And now they both point to the same commit. And I, I really have a linear history, don't I? That's why fast forwards are great. You can disable that. If you want to record the fact that you did a merge, you can do a no FF, no fast forward. And it will create that bubble for you. It will create the extra merge and say merging from these two branches. And, and uh, you, you, if you want your merge commit, you can have it. But these are, these are much easier to follow if you're tracing through history. There's a rebase. We're going to make a branch. Oh, I got it right on this one. Uh, we D, F, G. OK. If I do git rebase topic, git rebase um, takes the named branch, in this case topic, the, what we're naming it, and it replays it onto the tip of the current branch that we're on. 
So now it's really E prime, F prime, G prime. Why is that? Yeah, these are not the same E, F, and G that you had. They include now the changes that were introduced by D. Rebasing is also nice because it gives you a clean linear history. A lot of people really like that. Um, it can also royally mess up other people if you are rebasing published histories. So don't, don't do that. It, it, uh, because you're changing the commits. Changing the commit IDs, it makes people just really cranky, especially if they have work done. Um, yeah, you don't want to push a, a history that you've rebased um, you know, from, from something that's already published. Any questions at this point? You guys are way faster to pick this up than some of my other groups. I think uh, usually by this time we're like uh, you know at uh, at an hour and and a half or something like that. So we're we're cruising through this. All right. So Git checkout. Uh, what I'm going to talk about now for the next couple minutes are some of the porcelain commands and how they are composed from some of the plumbing and other porcelain commands. So when you do a checkout. Checkout changes the branch head points to, and then it updates the working directory as it traverses those tree objects. A fetch retrieves all objects, trees, commits, and if you specify, I think, dash A for all uh, refs from a remote location. It's like a big old rsync, and it doesn't have any side effects other than pulling in all this new stuff. Your own references, your own branches stay pointing to the same things. So it's almost always safe to... I, I say almost because I'm not absolutely certain, but I've never had a problem doing a fetch. You're just you're just pulling down history and objects and blobs and things like that, but you're not messing with your own state of things. Your branches and your tags and things are 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 where they should be. A pull is a fetch plus a merge. When you say git pull, you're saying you're asking git to go pull something down, get, fetch all the things, and then you're saying and now bring me up to date. Uh, make my branch pointer match the branch pointer that I just pulled down. And this is where you might add a dash dash rebase if you want to help your branch kind of fast forward along. A clone, when I say git clone repo, what I'm doing is I'm creating the directory. Usually it will pick off the uh, last part of the path and subtract the dot git. Uh, you can also give it a path specifically, but it will create that directory for you, go into it, run init, then it will do a fetch, then it will do a checkout. That's a clone. Have you ever um, gotten to a point where you're working on something in a repo and uh, someone says, hey, we got a problem in this other you know, branch and master or whatever, and you're like, I got all these stages, what do I do? Oh, I'll just rename them dot back, right? No, you don't do that. You, um, you do a git stash. Stash is a, stash makes a branch. Then it, uh, uh, there should be an add in there too. It adds all of your changes, commits them, and then goes back to the previous branch you're on and checks that one out. So all your changes are now committed into this other branch that you don't know where it is, the stash branch and it pops you back out. So stash is like, take all the changes I've made in relation to where the last commit was, put them away. Now you can uh, check out master whatever you were working on and uh, fix the bug, you know, commit, push, and then you can do git stash pop. So pop looks at your current branch and it goes, compares it with the stash branch, does some diffs, applies the patches onto your current um, branch, and then does a reset on the stash branch. It means it pops it back one, one directory. And usually, if some people stash really deep, and I don't like to stash really deep because I can never keep track of what I've got in the stash. You can think of it like a um, a stack push pop kind of thing, and that's why they use this terminology push and pop. But it's really just a branch. You remember when we first were adding files in our Git repository, we added some file, another file, renamed to wonder file, and there were a couple of files that weren't referenced by any trees or any commits that I mentioned that they were unreachable by Git. 
uh, garbage collect and prune are two ways that Git uses to find, identify, and remove these stray objects. You generally, I, I almost never run these commands. In fact, I will go so far as to say I never run these commands on, um, <clears throat> on repositories. I have run them, but only in very special circumstances. Uh, and this is the other thing I was going to mention. When uh, repositories get to a certain size, Git will use what are called pack files. You may have seen those as you've cloned old repos, especially. Um, a pack file you can think of as a tarball with objects or blobs in them. And I don't know how they're ordered in there. It might be oldest first. They may be related, uh, maybe all in a subdirectory. I don't know. But, but it, uh, it saves a lot of network time because you're not doing an open, fetch, and a close, open, fetch, close. You're just doing one open, big old fetch, and a close on that. And then um, and Git can treat them. Git can, knows how to refer to the objects inside of these tar files just fine. Um, that is it. Uh, here are some credits for some uh, some of the images I've used, and um, that is it. Are there any questions at this point? <laughs> well, contact me here if you have any questions further. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.